Hello and welcome. I think we're good to go. Uh, my name is Tom Reichert. I, look, I lead all things digital and all of our global practices within BCG. And I'm very happy to welcome all of you here in the room. And what I understand are the couple of hundred people on the web live stream that are joining us this afternoon. So it's great to have you all here and all to ha great to have you all virtually. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome Ishmael Sojani and Andrea Gallego you know, together here for a wonderful chat this afternoon. Reshma is leading the way on a topic that we're all very passionate about, namely how to harness the power of diversity, and more specifically, a topic that I get to deal with a lot, and so therefore I'm really looking forward you know, to what you're sharing with us today, how we engage more women in the technology digital world, you know, given how much of our future is going to be in, a, in that space. Now, you're leading, you're the CEO of Girls Who Code. I think you started 2012, yep. and it's now 2019. You have about 185,000 mm -hmm. uh, girls, students, you know, yep. who are engaged in the program, which is a very stellar progress you know, on it. Um, very interesting. I think you've been recognized as the most effective non-for-profit you know, organization. But the one title of your personal recognition <laughs> that I really like is the Forbes what is it, most powerful women, or women who change <laughs> the world the most. You know, like that. Wouldn't we all want to be called you know, something <laughs> along those lines? So it's terrific uh, to have you here. I think you're making something very, very special happen in a world that is not always the easiest, but is a very dynamic mm -hmm. you know, part of it. And so we're very glad to have you here. Now you have a long and extended professional career beforehand <laughs> as an attorney in immigration. I'm sure you're going to share parts yes, of it. Yes. And how it all folds together at the end of the day mm -hmm. uh, to the journey. Andrea, many of you will know, Andrea is a real superstar in our Gamma team, our chief technology officer and partner and really codes. You know, quite <laughs> a lot. Andrea and her team have been building a leading edge AI platform, Source AI, that all of our data scientists are working on. It's making a huge difference and um, it's just wonderful to have you broadly in the team, for you to have set up this conversation today and to lead the conversation, so it's wonderful. Thank you, and with that, you know, we're gonna get started. I think the deal is, you're going to have a conversation first, then we'll open it up for question, including on the live stream and in the room, and let's just have a bit of fun together. So, awesome. Super. thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank, thank you, you so much. Oh, and don't worry about the baby. It's not gonna bother <laughs> us. So, it's like, there's normally so, some... Yes, <laughs> but we want to... Yes, yes, yes. We're starting very young. Yes. <laughs> so, Reshma, first of all, thank you so much for being here. Um, I've been a fangirl of yours for many years, <laughs> so I appreciate it. I have a younger sister who's also an engineer, um, and what you're doing is just an incredible inspiration. Your brave not perfect hashtag has taken mm. over the Instagram world. Mm. Um, so just it's just for me personally an absolute honor to have you here oh, at BCG. You. So thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Promise myself to try not to cry. So <laughs> I'm getting there. No, you can totally cry. <laughs> um, so. I know a lot about you, read your book, I know your bio, but for us on the live stream and for those in the room, do you want to share a little bit about sure. how, you, how you got to where you are today? Sure. Um, so I guess I'm a weird person to have uh, started Girls Who Code. I'm not a coder. I was terrified of math and science growing up. Um, my parents came here as refugees in 1973. So as cheesy as this may sound, like I've always, I love this country. And I wanted to think about, from the time I was 13 years old, like what I can actually do to like give back. Graduated $300,000 in student loan debt. Uh, I was living in you know, Chicago, Illinois, and thought that I would you know, move to New York City and pay off that student loan debt in like a year or two. Never <laughs> happened. I'm still paying off that student loan debt. Um, and I was working in finance. And I'm sure none of you know what I'm talking about, but I hated my job. And I was in my early 30s, and the thing that I kept thinking about was like, is this it? Like, is this the rest of my life? And I, I remember my best friend called me, and it's funny how your best friend always calls when your life is falling apart. <laughs> and I just walked into this windowless conference room and just cried. And through my tears, I heard her say, you know, just quit. So, you know, my friend, she didn't say anything profound, but there was something about hearing those words at that moment that made me feel like, yeah, 
I can quit a job that I hate and go do the thing that I know that I want to do. And so I did, and I decided to run for Congress. And so I ran for United States Congress in a Democratic primary a decade ago. I basically did what Ocasio did 10 years ago, except she won and I lost. <laughs> and when I ran in this Democratic primary, I was the only one in the entire country. This election cycle, there's probably 300 people running. So when I did it, it was like, you, it was insane. It was an insane thing to try to do. Um, but I thought I would shake every hand, meet every voter, right? And I'd win. And uh, I lost miserably, less than 19% of the vote. I had raised like $1.4 million. On, I got like 1,000 votes. It was horrible. Don't do the math. <laughs> and, um, but the thing that I kind of came out of that election was like, oh my God, I'm not broken. You know, I think a lot of us think that if we try something and it doesn't work out, that it will literally physically break us. And it didn't break me. And it was this like revelation, like, wow, like I can actually maybe do a lot of things I want to do and just try and it not work out and it be okay. And that's really what led me to start Girls Who Code. Amazing. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, a lot of you have had uh, Reshma sign, sign uh, the book or have read it. Um, I've read it front, front to back. And the one, you know, we've said we made a lot of strides, right? Yeah. And one part stuck out to me, and I'm going to pull out and I'm going to read it, because I, I just, I have to, because mm -hmm. um, it was from 2014, um, and I remember this because my sister loved Barbie. Um, and this was in 2014. Now, you guys know Mattel and Barbie and Lego have been doing this amazing job, right, to get women in engineering. And so there's this book where Barbie and, her skip, and Skipper, her sister, are chatting, and it says, Skipper says, your robot puppy is so sweet. Can I play your game? Barbie laughs and says, I'm only creating the design ideas. I need Steven and Brian's help to turn it into a real game. 2014. I mean, you've been in this for, yeah. right? Like, why would Mattel, you know, yeah. I'm thinking like they went like 20 steps forward yeah. Yeah. by writing this book yeah. and then I think took like 75 yeah. step backwards like why do you think that's still happening it's just so ingrained in our culture you know I mean you have Barbie dolls that that said used to say I hate math let's go shopping instead right you have t-shirts you can buy in forever 21 that say I'm allergic to algebra I just went to the Lego store on 23rd and 5th last week because I wanted to buy a birthday present for my friend's daughter and literally I had one aisle to pick from the entire store was for boys, and I could either get a Lego set that was a kitchen or a dollhouse. And it's insane, right? Yeah. And so it's just everywhere you look, there aren't things, and we wonder, but our culture is telling our girls that this is not for you. Like, you can't build stuff, you can't create stuff, you can't invent stuff, like you're not good at math, you're not good at science, and they're listening. And we wonder why. And you know, part of what I talk about in the book, and, and I realize in having a son, it's like so much of feeling like you can make things is by getting your hands dirty. Right. And I'm sure you did that, right? And your parents yeah. encouraged you and your sister to do that at a very young yeah. age, was to take things apart and to think about problem solving and to build and create and to get dirty and to get messy. And like, if we're not offering those things to our kids, our daughters, we wonder why they just want to grow up to be princesses. Yeah. But I think if you were a conspiracy theorist, this is very manufactured. I'm Indian. My mother's an engineer. All her friends are engineers. You watch a Bollywood movie, and almost every serial <laughs> has a female protagonist that is an engineer. And so you wonder why, when you go to the engineering schools, it is full of women. You, Ireland, uh, Mexico. I mean, there's so many countries across the country, across the world, that don't have the problem that the United States has, and our problem of getting women into science and medicine and and math and technology is very much related to the toy aisle. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so, I have a, as Tom said, I have a small startup yeah. inside of inside of BCG because the lovely BCG lets us, you know, be our own entrepreneurs. And you mention a lot about failure, right? And this coming from the startup world, right? Uh, I've heard it a million times. You walk into a VC, uh, you know, you walk into Andreessen or anyone else, and they'll say, "When have you failed before?" 
Now, you look at today and all of the media that startups are getting, their yeah. IPOs are blowing up yeah. um, in a bad way. I think maybe Spotify yeah. might have been the most successful startup. Yeah. WeWork is another story altogether. Yeah, yeah. We won't yeah. talk about WeWork right now or we. Um, is there a lesson to that as well? Is yeah. there failing too much? Is yeah. there, you know, I wonder when we say, hey, let's fail, let's fail fast, if some of us have taken that to some other extreme or is that just a, you know, is this kind of startup kind of implosion just like a, a fact of the well, economy? Well, I think that we have overstated the privilege of failure for men, right? So that there's a, there's a I just wouldn't get that twisted. Mm. We have like romanticized and fell in love with the, Elon Musk's of the world, mm -hmm. who, and we think that it's okay to like smoke a blunt, <laughs> right, on Joe Rogan, and like that is an example of why I should give you another billion dollars. Right. That's our problem, mm -hmm. right? Um, because, and I, and I do think, because I think that there is the power of failure. I don't think you learn unless you fail. And, you know, part of what I talk about in my book is that I think that for so long, for men, we have basically encouraged them to fail, encouraged them to take things apart and to break things and to try things. And they're able to iterate and iterate yeah. and learn and iterate and learn. Whereas women don't have, we haven't raised them to, to do that. And so like, I don't think that you can um, totally associate kind of the culture of Silicon Valley, Valley failure and the big blow ups that you've seen like with yeah. the problem of failure. I feel like that's a problem with the bro culture. <laughs> Just different. I do think, though, what I encourage people to do is really think about whether we allow women to fail in the same way. Hmm. So black girls, for example, young black girls are um, suspended from school higher than any rate of any other children for doing the exact same conduct. Women in the law are disbarred at twice the rate of, for doing the exact same conduct. Women in finance are 20% more likely to get fired for the exact same conduct. So we don't have the same amount of tolerance for failure for women, which is why we have to, we, no wonder why women don't take the same amount of risks and the same amount of failures, you know? And so that, we have to solve that problem, right? right? And, and I think that that is very important for us to recognize, like are we evaluating men and women the same for the same act? I was, um, I'm on a plane a lot, and often when I'm on a plane, I'm like a little incognito, uh, i.e. I'm in like a hoodie with a baseball cap and a pair of sweatpants. I'm sitting in the Delta line uh, three weeks ago, and there's these two guys behind me. We're, all, we're going to Chicago. I'm going for a speech. They kind of greet each other, and they say they're going to a board meeting. And one guy one says to guy two, where are you going? And he says, I'm going to this board meeting, Fortune 500 company. He's like, how's that going? Ah, it's not going so well. You know, we just got a female CEO. Really? Why isn't it going well? Is the stock price going down? No, actually the stock price went up from 15 to $52, but you know, she's not a leader. She's not a leader. Why is she not a leader? Well, she's a good goalkeeper. But so you see how this he plays out, right? There's a narrative happening about her doing who she is because she is a woman. Right, just a, instead of a person. Right, this person. And even right. when you have the same kind of standard, stock prices, attrition rate, failure, products right. created, even if we still line up exactly the same, we're still not good leaders. And so, and I, I again think that because there's not a tolerance for mistakes for women than there are for men. Right, thank you. Um, so this was kind of similar. I'm pushing buttons a little bit because, yeah. you know, I, I think about this a lot. Um, just thinking of my mom's, you know, kind of culture as yeah. well. And um, so we've seen great strides in the Me Too movement, right? We've seen the Weinsteins of the world yeah. to get finally kind of brought down for the, the years of stuff yeah. that they're doing. Sometimes, though, I worry that there's, because like you're saying, because our culture is still kind of catching up and our society is still catching up, that will face so much backlash yeah. from the Me Too movement yeah. and from movements like that, that will end up creating this kind of antagonistic, yeah. let's, you know, to your point about the bro culture, like we almost enhance it because we get this like opposite as big as an effect. Yeah. Um, I mean, is that just something we have to see happen? Or? I just disagree with that. I mean, have you been reading some of the stories that have come out about the women in their lives and what's happened to them in the post Me Too movement? Yeah. I mean, I don't think that there were a lot of rewards um, from for, from their personal perspective on bravery, and and so I think that like, 
I don't know. I think we worry too much about what the boys think about us. Mm. You know, at the end of the day, I don't care what they think or how they feel. You know, and I, I actually think a lot of men in the room also similarly don't care. Yeah. I think that we are in a culture, I always say like 40% of girls who coach teachers are men. There are so many, there, I just saw a dad bring his little daughter in this room, right? Like there are so many men out there who have daughters, um, nieces, you know, mothers. I had this Girls Who Code employee stand up, we were, had a staff stand up last week and he said, I'm here because of my mother. My mother should have been a NASA scientist, but like society didn't let her get here, there. And so I'm going to make sure that my, my, no one else has to face what my mother faced. That's the type of men I see, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So to me, I am all about activating them in our movement to get them to be in solidarity with us, to be a part of our sisterhood so we can actually start moving things forward. I'm not worried about what I call the 10% of men mm-hmm. uh, that act like jerks, right? Um, and I'm not worried about the backlash from them because I think anybody who's complaining about the Me Too movement is not part of what I think is the majority of men who actually agree and believe that things have to change. I'll give you an example. And, and I think that this new generation of men, quite frankly, is very much aligned with what I'm saying. I um, recently visited the Rochester Institute of Technology. And RIT had gone from being about 22% female to being about 36% female on about five years. So I went to go speak to the women in computing group to kind of learn about what they've been doing. And as I was speaking to them, I noticed like four or five guys sitting in the back. So afterwards, I went up to them and I was like, you know, who are you? And they're like, we're the men who support the women in computing group. They had formed a club inside a club, right? (laughs) And at first I thought they were messing with me, but they're like, you know what? We know that we have it, that the women in our our, our classrooms have it twice as hard as us. Right. So we think it's up to us to stand up against microaggressions in the classroom. We think it's up to us to talk to our female you know, sisters in arms about what we learned about how it's like to interview at Twitter or Facebook. So they took it upon themselves to understand their male privilege right. to really figure out what they were going to do to push the ball forward. I think that's the future. Okay. You and, know? Yeah, what you're saying kind of hits me when it comes to you know, when you're parenting and your, your mom says something and you're a teenager and you're like, well, she'll only believe her friends. Yeah. She won't believe me. Right? Yeah. Because you're not the same, regardless, we're a species, right? And we're animals at, at our heart, right? So I, I get what you're saying in the sense of like, well, men have to tell other men this, right? Men have to tell other men this. And like, because I bet you every guy in this room has been in an, a meeting or an office where somebody made a microaggression and they went home to their wives or their spouses and said, oh, I didn't, I didn't appreciate that, but they didn't say anything, right? right, right? And right. so like part of what I have learned over the past year, you know, I, I gave a speech about what bravery means to men uh, at Bill Gates' summit in between him and Warren Buffett to 100 of the Fortune 100 CEOs. And this was my truth, right? And I said, it is up to you to say stuff. You also can't fight for gender equity be- for brand cover, <laughs> right? <laughs> you need to do it because you believe yeah. it and people will follow your lead. Like men want, I mean, they will follow other men. And, and so you have an opportunity to be a role model in, in this very powerful way. Yeah. And, you know, and, and things like, you know, I, I said to men, like part of being brave is be quiet. Men speak 80% more than women in meetings. And we can't be brave if we can't get a word in. So sometimes just give us a beat. You know, and so I think there's a lot of teaching that needs to be done. And I know we're like, oh, I'm tired of teaching, <laughs> right? I get it. But I think that this is an, a hugely opportunistic moment for us as women in building allies in this movement. In this, and, and I think we should take advantage of it and, and, and literally sign up, I think, these tremendous men that we have uh, in this movement and really give them, they want, they want to know what should I do. Yeah. Yeah, and I, there's, a, there's another book, that's what she said, which I'm sure you probably yeah. know about. And they, they have this conversation about actually the, um, the hesitancy and the kind of discomfort from having the conversation yes. of I'm a woman, I'm a man, is because a lot of, a lot of men, and they've said, this is just through interviews on the, yeah. uh, in the book, right, are 
I just don't know how to react or what to say yeah. or what's good and what's bad. And yeah. a lot of things have created a little bit more of like, a, wait, should I say something? Is this wrong? So yeah, there is that kind of comfortable space to create, to just say, well, and I think yeah. part of it is socialization. We have been socialized to not say what we think. Right. Every single person in this room probably sometime this week got bumped into and you said, I'm sorry. <laughs> right? We have been silencing ourselves since we were children. And what happens is it's not that we don't, um, we don't walk away from these incidences and feel us. We're pissed about it. But we sit in that anger and that resentment. We're more likely to, you know, I can't tell you the amount of times where I've had friends of mine who are just new moms and they want a little more flexibility and they're already out looking for a new job rather than just asking their manager for Fridays off. And it's like, wait, you haven't even had the conversation. How are you going to say no? But we build up a lot of, and it's not our fault. Literally, we've been socialized to not ask for what we want, to not say what we feel. And, and so that, that is one dynamic you know what I mean, that I think is, is really important and yeah. powerful. And then I think for men, it's like they've actually never really been challenged in the way that they need to, and, and never really been educated, right. quite frankly, in the way that need, they need to feel educated, they need to be educated. And so they also need to not feel resentful and not take, like, nothing that pisses me off more than like this bullshit of like, oh, I don't know after me too whether I can take her out for coffee, come on. <laughs> like, you don't know the difference between like, like, give me a break. Yeah. So that is to me this, again, oversensitization, over coddling right. that we do of men. That is also playing out. So, so it's, it's, it's both of these. Right. You know, and so we have this opportunity to have very honest conversations uh, with one another and between genders that we've never had before that we need to have. Yeah. Awesome. I have one more question and then I'll take yeah. it to the live stream audience and to the audience here. Um, so a lot of the, the book and what you've been saying has this, you know, dare to be brave, right? Dare to fail. Uh, you know, we're a consulting organization. Yeah. You kind of know how we yeah. work. If there's one other piece of advice you could give us today, what, what would it be? Well, I mean, I think that like bravery is like a muscle that you have to practice. And I think part of it means that you have to like practice imperfection. And like one of the things, how many of you guys, I bet you, how many of you at the end of your email have a note that says something like, please excuse the typos, I'm typing on my phone. None of you? How many know what I'm talking, you have one. But do you guys know people who do? Yeah. Right? And they're mostly women, right? Do you know any man that has that? I've never, I do. you do, yeah. you I have, do, yeah. okay, you have that. No. No. <laughs> okay. He's like, no, I don't. Tell him doesn't have that. <laughs> but so yes, I know. I, I know think that we yeah. live in this world where we overemphasize the implications of mistakes, right? And I think email and typos are a great example of this, right? We quickly go from, I made a typo to you think I'm stupid to I'm gonna get fired to oh my god, all in about ten seconds, <laughs> and we overinflate we overinflate the incidents of this feeling, and so we start overthinking everything. And we spend way too much time on things that are irrelevant. And there are a lot of these things in our lives that we do. And so I think it's like narrowing in on how, what are those things for us and literally practicing imperfection to see kind of what opens up in your life. And from a time perspective, I think is really, really important. Thank you. Thank you, Reshma. So, we're going to start taking some questions from the live audience and then from the live stream. I know we have a little bit of back and forth, so I'll take one from each um, until we run out of time. Yes. Yeah, we have mics going around. So I love that you talk about you know being brave and speaking up, but I also sometimes find that when you do, you get burned. Yep. Uh, so how do you navigate that when you have sharp elbows when as a woman you're like, hey, this is not okay versus maybe someone else not getting yeah. the same reaction? So it's so it's totally true. I mean, listen, I, I feel like, you know, Carol Dweck I use this quote, she has this quote that she said, if life were one long grade school, girls would rule the world. <laughs> and it's true. We've been coloring in the lines. We've been playing by the rules. We've been nice and proper, and, and it's not working. I mean, you look at every single industry from consulting to law to business to finance to tech, we're nowhere at the top. And, you know, it, it, I think we need, to, we need to do something different 
to really see the type of change. And I think you kind of see this again in this younger generation. Cardi B, her, what's her tagline? No F's given. She doesn't care. Greta Thunberg, right? If, I don't know if anybody saw her on The Daily Show. Mm -hmm. Like to me, it's like that's the future. And I think that if we can get to a place where we change, I think for so long we're, we're used to women behaving a certain way. The pleases and the thank yous and the, oh, I'm sorry, right? And so when you see a woman that's behaving out of character, immediately you feel like, oh, I don't know if I like that. And I think that that's why they're almost, we all need to kind of similarly behave like Greta and have a sea change in terms of what it, what, it, what, it, what it looks like, what a leader looks like. And I'm not saying that it's not gonna be hard. You know, I pay a cost, I, I, don't, I don't care. I, I say what I say and I feel when I, and, I, and I'm not gonna tell you that I don't pay a cost for that. Um, I certainly pay a cost for that. Um, but I, I'd rather live my life that, like that than hold back and have regrets. And that, just to follow up on that, I find like sometimes people, and maybe it's my, my sister's age, but there is also a way to do that with integrity, right? And with, you know, being patient. And we have many of you, many of you know, I'll call her out whether she wants me to or not, but Mickey, um, who was our chief marketing officer and has now since moved on to a different role. If you guys don't know her or have seen her talk or just like you, there, there is a, she's not mean or rude or, but she, you know, stands her ground and she kind of commands, just like you do, yeah. commands a presence in the room while she gets to be who she is. Yeah. You know, so I think there's also, you do it in the way, right. It's about you being you. I think if you're, you know, I think there's just far too many of us who want to say something, right. but we don't. So we're holding back who we are. And I think that's kind of what I'm saying is like, and, and, and listen, they're, they're, we don't like strong women. We don't. I mean, and so we're going to have to go through a phase where we're changing what it looks like. And, and again, I think we're following, in many, way, you're, in many ways, I feel like this new generation is kind of leading the charge from that. Thank you. Hi, my name's Elisa. Thank you so much for being here. So I have a question with the stigma of women seeing other women as threats in some cases. Yeah. Do you have a way that you recommend providing feedback to other women in a way that shows that you still support them and you want to be a catalyst of their growth, but yeah. don't, you know, don't bring them down? Yeah, it's a great question. Look, I used to for a long time, um, as a manager not give honest feedback because I didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And then I realized that like I was doing a disservice to them because I grew up in a very like Asian household. So like I've lost two elections. The next day my father sent me an email being like, here are the 10 things you did wrong. <laughs> you know, <laughs> everybody knows in my, I, um, I love Serena Williams and Serena Williams literally lives on the edge of her ability and critical feedback. So she is a coach who's sitting there do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again. That's how I've, I've wanted to grow as a leader. So everybody around me, from my husband to my dad to Gloria, knows that they're supposed to say, yeah, that wasn't good. Do that again, do that again, do that again. I love that. I thrive off of that because I want to be the best that I possibly can be. So we all got to get to a place that we want to be Serena Williams. And, like, and so I think that part of it is like, how do you get your team to recognize that this isn't personal, right? That this is, um, this is about growth. And you can't grow if people don't tell you the truth. Um, and that also means that you have to immunize yourself from what feels personal. So like I collect rejection letters and I literally paste them up on my bathroom wall. And so it's just, to me, it's like I, I, I set myself up to get rejected all the time. And so it doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. And it doesn't, it doesn't feel good, but it's like, it doesn't feel like it's like a punch in the gut. Does that make sense? And, and I think that what's, what the problem is, and I have a 16 year old niece and I'm literally on the phone with my sister all the time about this, is like, if you think about the younger generation, they got none of this. They've been so over coddled, over parented, wrapped in bubble wrap. If they suck in gymnastics or put into dance, they have never received, <laughs> it's true, yeah. right? So it's, a, it's harder. It's like harder to give that honest feedback the younger and younger and younger your team is. And so how do you put that into your work culture? 
should we change the education of boys and girls? How can we educate our daughters to believe that they can do all they want? Yes, throughout all your parenting books. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I think that we're, I think part of it is like we have to really start at a young age of teaching our daughters to be brave. And part of that starts with, um, and, and, and you know, part of that starts with essentially getting them to get their hands dirty. You know, when your daughter's messy and her dress is the filthy, don't change her, let her be. If she goes to robotics class and she's bad at it and she comes home, she cries, sign up for another robotics class, right? You basically have to teach your daughters at the youngest of possible ages to stop giving up before they try. And what happens is by eight years old, they either think they're good at something or they're bad at something. And that then translates for the rest of their life, right? Some people, of course, nobody in this room, you, you even stay in jobs that you are good at, but you don't like. You stay in marriages that are fine, but you're not in love, right? There are so many things that you do on a daily basis that you're literally stuck in because you got confused. We all were taught that if I'm good at something, that means I should like it. And there are two very, 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 very different things. The other thing is like, this is not a kid's book. This is, for, this is for all of you in this room. Because there's nothing that irritates me more when like, someone's like, oh, I'm going to give this to my daughter. I'm like, no, you read it. <laughs> you read it. Because here's the thing, they're watching you every day. Every time you judge what you look like in your jeans to like, what your friend said, they're literally watching you and mimicking you and repeating. It's like rinse and repeat. So it's like generations of like socialization of perfection over and over and over and over and over again. Now, it's the same thing with our sons. I'm a boy mom, not by choice, but I am now. <laughs> um, and, you know, I recognize even like what a gift that is too, right? In terms of like my contribution to not just like feminism and society, but also with my son. My son is super cautious and like he does not like getting dirty. He is not jumping on any monkey bars. He's like a walking little Gandhi. You know what I mean? <laughs> and everybody, including my husband, is always trying to man him up. And so we got to let our boys be our bo like who they are too. So it goes both ways. You talk a lot about how bravery is a muscle and how we all have to train ourselves through little acts to become yeah. more brave. And I think what I'd like to hear from you about is, I think it's hard. Yeah. Change is hard and training ourselves to be brave and being rejected and setting ourselves up for failure is hard. And I think, how do you train our mindset? Because I do think the first rejection letter will feel like a gut punch. Yep. And the second and third probably do too. So how do you get out <laughs> yes, of that yeah. and, like, and build yourself back up? Even if you do it on it's purpose. It's a constant process. I mean, I, don't, I think that we have this perception that you're born brave and you're not. And I think you also feel like, well, you're, it's just one and done. Now I'm going to be brave. I mean, I, I wrote this book and I fall on and off the wagon every week. You know, I, I remember after my California book tour, like we go to the, you know, my, I travel with my husband and my son. And we get to the Delta desk and, you know, the woman's like, congratulations, Mr. Johnny, you've been upgraded. What do I do? After I've been working 16 hours a day, I look at my husband. I'm like, baby, you take the front of the bus. I'll sit in the back with Sean. Nine Paw Patrol episodes later, 100 M&Ms thrown at my face. I'm sitting there and I'm watching my husband who's on his like, fifth glass of red wine, watching like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, my favorite Lady Gaga movie. And I'm sitting there and I'm asking myself, why did you do that? Well, oh, you wanted to be the martyr. You felt guilty that you were doing what you loved and being a bad mom. So you wanted to prove to yourself, you know what I mean, that you could do it. And so I literally walked up to the front of the bus and to my husband, I said, switch now. now <laughs> I didn't get it right the first time, but I recognized the behavior and I course corrected. Part of the problem is, is I think, like you said, you're changing your mindset. I think sometimes we're so set in the way we are or behave and we think it, we, it's too late for us that we don't actually go in deep and look at our behavior and ask ourselves why. What I'm asking you to do is every time you notice where you don't stand up for yourself, you don't ask for you what you want. You get the promotion. You think about the 10 reasons why you, show, you don't deserve it. You're not in this room. and You don't raise your hand right away because you're perfecting that question. All I ask of you is to ask yourself, why am I doing this? 
and, and start asking yourself that question and then preparing yourself for the next time the opportunity comes, you correct. Because literally, I have like been around the world. I am probably, what, 200 speeches this year? I probably speak to 6,000 people a week about this from Rio to you know, India to New York to Arkansas. We do the same 10 behaviors as women, whether we're black, white, rich, poor, gay, straight, the same 10 behaviors, right? And they, they probably, these 10 behaviors, we do them probably several times a week. So even if we don't do it once a week, we are making progress. And that's what I want, it's, it's progress. And let me be clear, this is very important for me to say, we have to continue to fight racism and sexism. That's the number one thing that is keeping women, people of color behind. But in the process, we have to give women and people of color strategies to thrive in the culture as it is. That's what this book is about. It's about how do you thrive with strategies in the culture as it is while we are trying to disrupt it. Here's a question. Uh, how do you find balance between assertiveness of opinion and also accommodate a status of unfolding for not knowing as a young woman in business? Oh God, I'm a bad one to ask, answer this question. I don't accommodate anymore. Um, you know, I think that you said, I think that there's a way of, I, but I know how to get my point across. Right. In a way, exactly. right? Like I speak to a lot of men in tech and I have now mastered, <laughs> you know what I mean? The conversation about gender equity in a room of men where by the end we're all consensus. And, and I've learned, so I think part of it is learning how to say your truth, like in a way that people can hear it but in a way that's authentic to you. Yeah, right, there's audience, there, there's so many different audiences and it's, I, f I feel the same way, like there's a, just like, it's funny, because we have this like consulting toolkit at BCG, but then for some reason, when we internalize it as women, it falls apart. Yeah. But it, it's so like cross-dimensional, right? Yeah. So like as a consultant, I have either a CEO who knows retail, or I have like a VP, or I have a colleague, yeah. or, and I change my, my I change my tone, I change, you know, yeah. and it's not because they're a woman or a man, it's right. because it's a different audience. Yeah. Um, and so I try to map that to like, okay, what do I want to say today? But I also, I mean, I can be assertive without offending someone, yeah. right? I'm, yeah. I don't want to walk in and be like, hey, you're an idiot, yeah. right? I yeah. do want to tell them you don't know what you're doing yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at all. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's way, and I just feel like sometimes we don't translate that yeah. into like what we want to say yeah. about ourselves. Yeah. No, it's true. It's true. I think it's about knowing your audience, getting your point across, and like figuring out how to get what you want. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you. I uh, hear so many um, gender and race-oriented talks these days that it's really great when I hear something new, and, and I like that position a different way. Uh, so my question was going to be around something because um, I think this is both you know a mixed space of allies as well as a brave space. Yeah. Um, that I find what's happening in given the existing culture, like so we're going on this path of, uh, and I'm very much <coughs> in that path of disrupting, but we're also working within the existing culture, right? Which we call acculturation in some ways. And what I find that that's happening now is that in that process of having more women in the board seats and in the room certain organizations are coming into being now that are for those C-level women. Yeah. Um, and now many of those organizations I find, two of which I know more personally, now have like a wait list, you know, because women are climbing yeah. over each other to get into those orgs. Yeah. And I can't sit here and say that that is not necessary, but I wonder if there's a different way for women to do this, given everything that we have at our, at our disposal as sisters, as yeah. many women who are discovering their self, discovering their goddesshood, discovering all sorts yeah. of elements of what's been kind of left out yeah. of the career mindset. Yeah. And so I wonder what your thoughts would be on that. What is that balance? Yeah, I mean, I just don't, I don't, I don't really think these exclusive organizations of women are actually helpful. Um, and I, I, I also think that this is a generational shift. Like for me, like I actually don't really want to be in rooms of just women like me. I actually want to be in rooms of women that I can actually help open the door for. 
Um, and sh to me, it's all about knowledge sharing, information sharing. Like I figured this out. Like, like there's nothing I do. Like I love to tell people how to get a TED talk, tell people how to write a best-selling book because I feel like I've navigated these spaces and I have something to actually offer and share. And and so so I, I feel like these exclusivity clubs are just old school. It's like we're creating a cis club, yeah. which matches the bro club. Yeah, which is it's like kind of just—it's like idea. old school. It's like old school, yeah. right? Um, and 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 yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it appears that the ethos of saying your truth and not caring might raise uh, proportionally with age and seniority levels. As someone very junior in their career and age, how do you create that space for yourself? So, uh, did you, uh, yeah, so okay. um, the kind of assertiveness and being true to yourself yeah. raises as you become a little more senior, mm -hmm. but how do you handle that when you're junior? Mm. You mean you pe people feel like they like can be more, more comfortable more as comfortable their senior just be because themselves. of their tenure and their seniority and they can say what they want because they're you know, the boss. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a good point. I This was something, so when we did a focus group for the book, um, I always felt like this younger, the, the younger generation are much more brave because they're, I mean, if you think about like every movement from like body positivity to like, you know what I mean, gender nonconformity, like every single progressive, I think, um, uh, topic has come from mm. younger, young, people. younger people. Like they've pushed the conversation in so many ways, which is so brave. I mean, I think about, you know, as a young mother, like I breastfed in a closet. You know what I mean? Like this, <laughs> these young folks are not breastfeeding in any closet, right? <laughs> They're getting like, you know, 3,000 square feet and like, you know, as they should, <laughs> right? So, but it was interesting is when we still did the survey, the bravest women were in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. So, I just feel like this younger generation can be more braver than they think. Yeah. And I think it's, you said, you said something too around um, not being afraid, you know, this whole kind of failure thing and in things imploding. I think we're doing a lot of this brave stuff on like Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, but then when it, the real gets real and your job is on the line, or you think your job is on the line. Like you, I think like we have a workplace identity yeah. and like a Facebook identity. Yeah. And it's like, well, when it's up against my boss, well, I mean. See, I think that's what's interesting. And in, even in this conversation about tech, I mean, as, as I always like tell my people to start organizing. Because I think at the end of the day, people are so um, talent, there's a talent race right there. And so I think that people will want the most, the best talent that they can possibly get. And I think that if you see, like Uber I think is a great example of this. People just didn't like where the company was going and they stopped getting the best engineers. Yeah. You know, Google is kind of facing this right now. Facebook is quite frankly facing this right now. So I do think that you can actually be brave in your culture right. and you should. Hi, um, I would love to get your advice on how you get people who may not look like you or have had your experiences to care about these issues. So my question is really pointed at the fact that I think in our careers, a lot of times opportunities and the ability to succeed comes from leaders above you, pulling you up, giving you those opportunities and, and recognizing you. And I think oftentimes that can get lost for a lot of people of minorities or women um, yeah. in the workplace. Yeah. And so how do you have that conversation and get people to kind of understand you and see things from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is like, look, I, I, think, I, I think most people, you know, Girls Who Code, for example, like when I started the organization, I insisted that half of our half of our um, half of the girls we taught were under the poverty line, and half the girls we taught were black and Latina. So every day when these girls and I have one of my students in the in our classrooms, every day when the students went to the classroom, you would literally have like Melinda Gates' daughter sitting next to somebody who was in a home, went, woke up in a homeless shelter in the morning. Because what's happened now is we don't. We have such segregated mm -hmm. friendship circles, such segregated schools, such segregated workspaces that we don't meet people who have different stories than us. And so it's very hard for people to be empathetic to somebody else's reality because they've never actually have a relationship with somebody or a friendship with somebody who went through that. And so I think we have to figure out how do we make that happen? How do we get to know each other? I can't tell you how many men as I go around the country talking about gender equity and technology are like, I didn't know women felt experienced that. I didn't know that what you're thinking when you're not raising your hand. I just thought you had nothing to say. 
Yeah. You know, and so so how do we we need to we need to change? I, I often say to people, who are your friends? My leadership team looks exactly like my friendship circle. It's diverse because that's who I have brunch with on Sundays. That's who my kids play with. That's who I, you know, hang with. That's who I go on girls trips with. Like it literally looks like my friends. And so if you don't have that type of diversity in your social life, you're not going to have it in your professional life. You're not your team because we are, we are risk averse as managers. I can, I always laugh. I can tell exactly my, my team who their interns are because they hire themselves. <laughs> and, and I think that that's our nature. We want to make the safe bet. So you made a, a significant change clearly to the lives and trajectory of many, I don't know which mic works. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you, oh, you're right. so you made a significant change to the trajectory of many girls during the school time and the experiences yeah. that they have now and therefore the setup you know, that they have going forward. Why this forward? We live in a world of lifelong learning these days. And so now I come back yeah. to BCG and where we are. And we want, of course, BCG and in all areas to look like the world around us you know, as our aspiration. So now a lot of women are joining BCG who might not have the digital tech experience, but so much of our business yeah. is in that way. And also we want to set up everybody to move on if and whenever they want to move on to a world where they can contribute. Yeah. Them. What's your view and recommendations that you have for the the next yeah. uh, 10 years yeah. in, to this past college, in university, in work life? How do you get into that world as a woman? And what would you recommend yeah, us to Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think you should never stop learning, right? And I think everyone should learn how to code. Um, I think technology is disrupting every single industry. And I think, especially as women, I know for me, like if I don't feel like I understand something, I move away from it. Right? So if I, now if I feel like I can understand how to communicate with an engineer because I have some basis understanding of computer science, it makes me more confident. And I'm more likely to raise my hand you know, for different opportunities. So I think it's like constantly wanting to learn and, 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 and be a lifelong learner. Because you, look, I've had eight careers. I was a lawyer, I worked in government, I ran for office, I'm a nonprofit leader, you know what I mean? I'm an author. And you know, I am constantly shifting and learning. You know, right now I sit on Harvard University's board, which is like, if you ever get a chance to sit on a university board, say yes, it is the most, if you want to talk about learning, you know what I mean? It's an amazing opportunity. You know, I sit on the MoMA board, I sit on the IRC board. I am like constantly, every year I start my year saying, okay, what are the three things, what's the three places I'm gonna make trouble? <laughs> you know what I mean? What are the three things that I'm gonna like take on this year? Um, and, and literally made trouble about. And that means that I have to then go in and like learn about something and learn about a topic. And I think that that's, that's critical. And I think we have, we're lucky enough to have your partner in crime, Elaine, yeah. who does Women Who Code. Yeah. Um, and it's just nice to see, I think, between the both of you, yeah. you're like creating this incredible, what looks like a lifelong journey yeah. of getting girls into programs. Yeah finding areas for women to create and, and yeah. go and do more. And it's just been, between the both of you, are creating yeah. this just incredible And if you think path. about the amount of jobs that are open, you know, yeah. we're not going to solve the problem simply by getting girls in That's high right. school to then major in computer science and then go into technology. I mean, we need a lot of people that are in marketing, that are in law, that are in finance, that like suddenly three, four years in at BCG are like, no, actually, I want, I want, to, I want to go into this, take a 12-week course, learn how to code, and then become a product. I mean, like, it exactly. can happen. And, Quite frankly, I feel like a vast majority of women that I meet today that are in the path didn't go the traditional right. way. Right. Yeah. I think you've been hitting reach your hand for a while. <laughs> I've been hitting project um, <laughs> now, so thank you so much um, for your speech today. And I wanted to go back to the goal of girls who code. Yeah. Uh, you made a point earlier about us, you know, modeling some of that, you know, brave behavior for children. And I'm the mother of a daughter, but so much of their time is spent in school. Yeah. And I feel like I'm in this tug of war with school. School yeah. is a, not a good place. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the environment of so many people who can either be affirmative for you or can put you down. So my question is, uh, how can schools support, you know, what we're, trying to affirm in our children and our girls in particular, um, as we are here trying to make them confident and more STEM focused, but also helping that when they get to school. Because I think sometimes, I saw it in my daughter's school, some of them are 
um, they're not that supported or they're not, they're still, right. you know, that still idea of you're not good at math and science, so go be a cheerleader or something. It's yeah. still there and it's still a little bit pervasive to me. Um, so how, what is your opinion yeah, on how they can help point. support? I mean, listen, I think the problem is, is that we still have these very cultural notions of what girls should do and what boys should do. And, and so I think that, I don't know, we have, we have 10,000 girls who code clubs across the country, which is insane. We probably won't run one of the largest after school programs in the country and we're oversubscribed. And so I see a lot of teachers and librarians who kind of get it and who want their kids, want, like they, they want this option for their, for their children. I think part of the problem is, is like we haven't iterated from an education point of view. Like my kids will take the same subjects that I took, that my father took, like nothing has progressed, right? Mm -hmm. And we're not updating, you know, our education system for the world as it is. That is a larger, I think, <laughs> beast in like conversation, right? That we need to, that we need to change. I mean, what I love about computer science is computational thinking is just problem solving, yeah. which is I think related to so many different, so many different topics. Um, and that it's not just like plug and chug. And even the way that we've designed the AP principles exam and like we've moved away from just regurgitating programming languages to figuring out how to problem solve and to think. Listen, I mean, I take my son everywhere. I, I believe that part of education is also like him being surrounded around the things that I see and the things that I experience in like my world. And I pay a lot of attention to, as a working mom, you know, it's not exciting, it's not great for me you know what I mean? I'm trying to give a speech. I have a great screaming four and a half year old. But like, you know, last week, you know, he said I had to give a speech at the new school and I saw him, you know, he's four and a half and he's, you know, sitting in the, sitting in the auditorium and he is not on his iPad. He is listening to me, you know, and he's listening to me talk about gender equity and equality and diversity and race and like all of it. And he's processing it. And so as much as like we can expose our children, you know, to our truth is better than anything that may happen in the, cool. their daytime. I, I, there's uh, someone who um, partners with us who has a daughter and um, he took her iPad because he's like, I got to give her an iPad, right? Yeah. Because, and he took all the apps off. And he put three apps. I think he put an app about space, an app on coding, and then like a fun coloring app, yeah. right? And it's like three months later, he comes home, and there is one question she will ask at nauseum. When are we going to space? Yeah. When are we going to space? When is Elon getting his act together? Yeah. We need to go to space. Uh, and also questions like, mom says Elon's crazy. I don't believe her. So I mean, I think to that point, we have this like amazing technology in our hands. Um, which we could, yeah, which by the way, like everyone is on, including our kids, 14 hours a day, 15 hours a day. And you can kind of curate that to a certain extent. I mean, they'll start yelling, maybe saying they don't have some things on there, but, um, and maybe that will kind of, maybe we can create our own education system in a way while the rest of it catches up. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, I, you know, I think about this a lot. I, um, you know, what's happened with Girls Who Code has actually been tremendous. And I feel like in many ways it's like it was, you know, like just in terms of, again, like uh, what we've done in terms of race and like bringing girls together and what we've taught them to be creators, to be innovators. Like even if they don't, even if they don't major in computer science, they've taken this experience and it will, sh it's shaped their experience in life and what they think that they can actually do. And we need to do more of that. You know what I mean? Both in the school day and outside of the school day, or as parents and thinking about what we're exposing them to on the weekends and after school. So we probably have time for one or two more questions. All right. Hey, uh, my name's Pooja. Thanks so much for coming. Um, you mentioned talking to rooms full of men about gender equity. I feel like I've run into situations, you know, when I'm having a conversation with a man, for example, trying to explain, like, why do women want to be called women and not girls? And I'll hear a response that's like, you know, if I say girl, I'm not, tr I'm not trying to bring you down. I'm not trying to be sexist. So why are you so sensitive? Like, I don't yeah. mean anything by it. And I find it hard to navigate that conversation without it going into, like, an accusatory space and you know, but with the other person just hasn't had that experience. Yeah. And so I wonder if you have tips on helping people who haven't had that experience, will probably never have that experience to like understand your like, perspective. Yeah, it's how I feel when I talk to my brother-in-law who's a Trump supporter, 
right? Mm -hmm. It's like you have to like. I think that I think the the thing is is um, we have to if we're going to move things forward, we have to figure out how we can actually move people forward, which means that you have to operate from a space of like. Uh, respect and like I'm gonna assume that you have the best of intentions and now then we're gonna engage in this conversation where we're both gonna learn and I think part of the problem for me I find is not getting frustrated right where I'm already like ears are closed mm -hmm. and I'm I'm seeing red and like it's <laughs> not it's not good um, and so I think I've had to really learn that for me being in most of like red states and with a lot of people who don't believe the things that I believe and trying to figure out and having a conversation. And I think for me, it's often started from like, I'm going through a very powerful personal experience right now in my life where um, I am in a close interaction with um, a family that's very different than me. And um, I, you know, and it's been this really beautiful way of like just recognizing how much love we have in our country and how much we're, we're so much more together than we are apart but we just have to take the space and time to honestly want to meet each other and it's that's hard work you know it's hard work yeah so maybe it's you know let's have a coffee in a couple of days and i'll explain it to you then and yeah. maybe it's just that space yeah and take 10 breaths and yeah. then come back to it but you have to, you can't, you know, I, I would encourage everybody when they have that conversation to just to not walk away, yeah. to make yourself have the conversation so he or she is walks away feeling a little bit more enlightened mm -hmm. about your feelings and about our feelings and about the conversation. And we move people along. Uh, you talked uh, about the importance of modeling bravery to young girls as a mother of a young daughter. Can you give some more tips for how to do that? Yeah. So one of the things that I've really been doing is I've been what I call making myself do things that I suck at. So I, um, I don't swim and I've made myself take surfing lessons and I'll take that surfboard onto the beach and like I'll be crying and there'll be like a five year old doing a handstand right next to me and <laughs> it's all very embarrassing and painful and but I walk away being like, wow, at least that was amazing. Like I tried. And I think that the more we can model, like I don't know if most people in this room have a hobby. Hobbies, right? And hobby isn't something that you're good at. Hobby is something that you actually enjoy. And I think that for many of us, I felt like by the time I turned 40, I didn't have, I didn't know what I liked anymore. I didn't know what I enjoyed. And everything I tried, I like yoga, like I'm horrible at yoga, but I love Shavasana. But every time I went to yoga <laughs> class, I'd be like, I would I'd have that voice in my head, right? Making me feel bad. And I wouldn't allow myself to enjoy this experience. So as much as, so I've like made myself go karaoke. I've made myself do, and I listen to my, I encourage you all listen to my <laughs> podcast, but like as much as you can do that stuff with your kids, and model that behavior, I think they'll be like, oh, I can do that too. On that note, yes, thank, thank you, you so much, Thank Rashma. you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, thank you so much for inviting me. Any, one last thing, are there technologists in the room? Yeah, one, more, handful, couple of you? Okay, great. I mean, but you're all a bunch of consultants that work with technology companies, yes? Okay, <laughs> some of you, not all of you. I'd like to say one thing before we end. So. I would be remiss if I didn't say this. You know, it's one of the things that I always get really frustrated about is um, this conversation that, like, the issue with women in technology is a pipeline problem, that we simply can't find them. I'm here to tell you that they are all there, <laughs> that we've taught 185,000 of them. There are, there are 30,000 Girls Who Code alumni that are majoring in computer science right now. If you look at any major college campus from Stanford to Berkeley to Harvard to Princeton, we're collecting this data, the engineering and computer science departments that are graduating are now at 33%. So if you are a technology company or any company and your technology workforce is less than 33%, it's your problem. It's your problem. You have a culture problem. And, and, and so the conversation around this is changing and we need to make sure that we're aware of it. And as we're discussing it, we recognize where the numbers are at and like what the opportunity is for us to basically make progress. So 
I just wanted to say that at every room I'm in, I'm going to be <laughs> saying this because this is kind of like, again, yeah. I think that the, the we'll narrative, get in there. the narrative yeah. needs to shift. You know, we're at a different stage in the problem. And if we keep using the same old narrative of like, we haven't taught enough of them and they're not out there and we can't find them, then we're not going to make progress as fast as we basically can. And what your point was about Facebook culture and Google culture and all of that, it leaves a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel for BCG. Well, because now all occurs, all occur, you know, well, we come I, in with all culture. You know, I was telling you, I was saying yeah. this to Tom, yeah. I do think that like, there's something that the Accentures and the McKinsey's and the BCG's of the world are doing right because your numbers are much better. I know they're not at 50 and I appreciate that that's your benchmark because it should be. <laughs> but I think, I think that there's lessons here to kind of share with the world in terms of like, you know, there, there, something's happening that's working here. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at you, right? <laughs> so like, so again, I think as much as we're sharing this with the rest of the world, I think we can start moving yep. things, the goalposts faster. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you all Thank very you much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.